My name is Ingi.net, and tonight I'm going to introduce you guys to YAML script programming in YAML. So, um, are there any Lisp programmers in the house? Raise your hand if you're. Oh, oh there are a few. Yeah. So, do you know that song, 99 Bottles of Lisp? <laughs> not yet. And it's, I hope it's not trademarked because I heard like your video gets taken down if it's trademarked. But um, <laughs> um, anyway, well, luckily I have a program that will print the lyrics so we can all sing it. So here we go. I set, it looks like there's way too much lisp. Yeah, uh, that's not gonna work. Uh, well, hey, look, we can uh, pass the program an argument of three and let's see what happens. Oh, three bottles. Okay, I can sing this now. So um, everybody, Andrew, you wanna finish chewing there? Three bottles of lisp on the wall, three bottles of lisp. Do take one down, cons it around. Two bottles of lisp on the wall. Two bottles of lisp on the wall. Two bottles of lisp. Do take one down, cons it around. One bottle of lisp on the wall. One bottle of lisp on the wall. One bottle of lisp. Do take one down, cons it around. No more bottles of lisp on the wall. Woo, woo. That's great. All right, so let's take a look at this program. This is a YAML script program, and here's your first taste of YAML script. So um, see, we have some functions. We use DEFN. Anybody ever use that to define a function? <laughs> ah. and, um, <clears throat> and we have a main function, so that's probably the starting point. Um, we have a number. We passed in three, but it default looks like it's 99. And then we uh, loop over it, say some paragraphs. The paragraphs are nicely laid out. Here we have some uh, just a paragraph with some interpolation. These parens don't do anything, you whispers. They're just supposed to look like this, which is text. Um, and then this little function tells us how many bottles. So we'll get back to that program later. Um, so let's compile this program with uh, the ys compile command. OK, anybody know what language that is? Hmm. Looks like closure to me. It is closure region. Yeah, maybe it is closer. So, um, and you can compile with minus C instead. Same thing. <clears throat> so let's take a look at these side by side. The, um, you know, I reformatted the output to be a little bit nicer, but so we have the YAML script on the left and the closure on the right. And um, like I said, I'm gonna show both of these more and we'll dig into exactly what's going on, but you can kind of see the, the comparison between the two. Um, one thing I'll point out now is, you know, in, in closures, usually like to start at the bottom. So you put your main function at the bottom. And if you do things in the wrong order, you have to declare things beforehand. But you don't have to do that in YAML script because YAML script can figure out where those declares need to go into the output. So that's kind of cool. All right. So uh, welcome, everybody. This is my first talk ever about YAML script. I've been working on it for, well, every day for eight months now, and we'll learn more about that in a second. So <clears throat> this talk was supposed to happen, what, Patrick, in this, I was aiming for December, and then we went for January, and they both didn't work out. So it's so great that they didn't work out because the language just would have been so much less, and it, it's probably gonna be way less tonight than it will be in a month. It's, a, it's just growing so fast, it's great. Um, so YAML script is written in Clojure, compiles to Clojure, runs as Clojure, but it's not written for Clojure, guys. So it's written for YAML users, primarily for now at least, um, to make YAML nicer and uh, more effective to use. So uh, this is a, it's a Clojure meetup. We're at Seizure, Seattle, a Clojure meetup. And um, I've talked to a lot of Clojurists in the last year, and most of them don't use YAML at all or don't really like it when they do. So, <laughs> um, but I invited, I actually sent out the invite to about 90 uh, people, none of whom were tried and true closures. And uh, three of my best friends showed up tonight. So this is uh, Eric and Aaron and, uh, and Andrew. <laughs> um, so, and then three other closures, and then me, who's right in the middle. So it's a, it'll be a battle. It's going to be great. Um, so I, I suspect that you close your eyes, I suspect everybody, the nine online are, um, 
are closer enthusiasts uh, or programmers for a living. And at first, you're probably going to gag when you see some of the things I've done. But uh, I hope that you will find it interesting and possibly useful um, in your day-to-day -day programming. So, um, all right. So I, I haven't said this yet. I'll say it on the next slide. But um, I am one of the inventors of YAML. Um, I was telling Patrick um, started in 2001, and and now it's everywhere. And I don't know. I mean, I've worked on a lot of things and my life and I don't know why that one took off, but it did. So, <laughs> um, but YAML script really does make working with YAML, it's gonna make it amazing and it already does. Um, and it's all thanks to actually to Clojure um, as we'll see. And I suspect YAML script, if it takes off, will be a gateway for YAML users to find uh, Clojure because I suspect there's more YAML users in the world than Clojure users. Although, you know, nobody cares about YAML at all, so no one identifies care a as lot as about closure. Yeah, <laughs> what's that, Aaron? Nobody identifies as a YAML user. A YAMList. A YAMList. Yeah. Until I make the T-shirts, and then a YAML mammal. It's more like a big deal. I'm putting that at the top of my LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> YAML YAMList. <laughs> um, all right. So about audience participation, I want. Um, everybody to participate as much as possible. So I made a web page, using the power of the web. Um, so if you were to go to yamlscript.org on your computer, yamlscript.org slash info, it will redirect you to the seizure page and has a bunch of links. Um, down here, it gives links about how to install this. You might want to go ahead and um, just install uh, YS right now. Just run this one command if you want. Um, but also, there's a Watch My Slides link. I'll even click it, see what happens. Yeah, so you can actually watch my slides in your browser if it's easier to see them that way. I don't know, maybe it's just easier to see them on Zoom, I guess. I don't know. But you never know what it's gonna be like, so I just figured when I was setting this up, I'd cover all my bases that way. Um, let's see, kind of lost that thing. There we go. Yeah, so, I'm really new to Clojure. I've only been doing it for less than a year, although I was telling somebody earlier, I was actually writing an implementation of Clojure well before I started using it daily. So, you know, it doesn't mean I'm an expert in any way. I really want to learn from you guys and you guys are going to see me like, why did he do it that way? He's like a total newbie. So I want you to speak up. So um, there's three ways we can do it. There's a, if you're in the Clojure Slack, uh, there's a pound YAML script. Um, channel that you can go to. Um, and then there's a, a link to um, Matrix. If you use that, you can go to the YAML script chat room. Patrick here is going to be monitoring both and just ask questions in there. And if he sees them when it's a good time, he'll tap me on the shoulder and I'll, I'll answer some questions there. Um, are you guys in the room? None of you have your computers turned on except for Brandon. So um, you can just ask me. Just don't ask too many questions. <laughs> One per 10 minutes, or we'll see how it goes. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, let's go. Also, yeah, but at the bottom line says code review is super welcome. If anybody like later on wants to just kind of cruise through the code and just give me some pointers, it would be really appreciated. Um, okay. So yeah, this is where I invented YAML in 2001. I met uh, these two guys, Clark and Oren. They were trying to solve XML. I was just, um, I had just made something that looked like YAML does now and somebody saw both of them put us together and I actually met that person and I told them, you know, like I looked them up and I found them and they, they worked at Amazon in Seattle. So we went out to lunch and I'm like, you wouldn't, well, YAML wouldn't exist if it wasn't that for that one email you sent. Um, it's just weird how things happen. Um, I like to think of myself as a computer language designer. Um, I've invented a lot of different little languages, some um, uh, text markup languages, some um, parser generators. And I always try to make things as like easy and pleasing as possible so that like, you know, it's just nice to look at and that kind of thing. Um, I, I, I made up this term acmeist um, in 2009 and it's, um, 
it's the, the idea of taking your ideas and making them into modules. So I've always been super into modules. As soon as I learned you could make a module, I'm like, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And so I made like 200 Perl modules, which is a lot. And then um, I started making them in other languages. And it's the, it's the idea of taking an idea and make, encapsulating it into a piece of reusable code and, and putting it out there. But I'm like, all these languages are the same. So if you're going to make an idea and put it out there, don't just do it in one language, do it in all of them at once, you know, which is impossible. But it was always been my dream to like do things to make it more possible. And now YAML script might be an answer to coming close, um, as we'll see. Um, yeah, so I don't actually love any programming language. I don't love YAML script. I don't love Perl. I don't, but I, I, I do like these and it makes me look old maybe, but um, I'm always looking at new stuff and these things just rock. So, um, and I also like Clojure a lot. It's, uh, I was telling most people come here and they give talks about Clojure to other Clojure people and they geek into Clojure. Clojure is just my way of making all of software awesome, but it's an awesome way to do it. It's like, um, it's the right language to be using to, um, as, as a, a means to an end with that end being everybody. So everything everywhere all at once, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so why is YAML popular? That's actually not a question, that's a statement. Um, there's a guy named Why the Lucky Stiff uh, from Utah. I actually met him in a restaurant once before he became famous and then deleted himself from the internet when somebody exposed him. Uh, but he was an amazing kid and he was one of the reasons he wrote a book about Ruby and, and he got Ruby people to notice it and it started shipping with Ruby way before it was good enough to, you know, it's like early Ruby shipped with YAML as a part of the, um, the install. And so I think that was a, a part of the way, the reason it got popular. Um, it's got a big spec, it's got lots of problems, I know. I mean, and lots of people um, love it or hate it, but Oh, I, I did want to give a shout out to, uh, I have a new team of maintainers and we put out a new spec um, in two, 2021. Um, and we didn't make any changes to the spec, but we went over it and tried to make it more easy to read. And um, so thanks, Tina, Panto, Emily, and Tom. You guys are great. Hello. You're welcome. Hey, Tina. <laughs> Tina from Germany. And she said she would join the talk if she couldn't sleep since it's 3 a.m., right, Tina? Yeah, it's 3 a.m., but it's a, it's a public holiday tomorrow. It's International oh. Women's Day. Excellent. Okay. By the way, your slides and teammate are not moving on. Oh, bummer. Um, I don't know why that is. Uh, are you on Zoom now? But we, yeah, yeah, we can see it on Zoom. Okay, thanks. Um, So yeah, a lot of people try to extend YAML, but it's problematic, you know, um, how uh, people template in Jinja and, um, you know, there's Helm for trying to combine files and stuff like that. Um, I think YAML script is gonna be a great way to do it. And with not just a specific thing, but anything you can imagine, anything that Clojure could do. So we'll see that, um, yeah. So, Cool thing is at some point I'm like, wait, I should just make all YAML files that exist now valid YAML script programs. I mean, I have to, or this thing's never gonna take off. And then I'm like, I have to make this. So you can use YAML script as your YAML config loader instead of whatever you're using now. And the cool thing about that is you use it in any language and it will work exactly the same because it's built off the same. It's just a binding to a shared library. Um, so it's going to work exactly the same. It's going to pass all the same tests. It's the, you know, usually if you've used YAML in more than one language, you'll notice that, that, that none of the two are alike, right? They all have their own set of bugs and APIs and different things they decided to implement or not, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, there's this uh, YAML script. Should we save questions or should we just have questions as you go? Aaron, do you have a question? I have a question. <laughs> What's your question? <clears throat> so are you like, what you just said was interesting about using YAML script as the interpreter for consistent YAML parsing, right? Loading, yes. Loading, yes. So then, are, like, is that like a recommendation that I that I could that I should like 
uh, use yeah. YAML script to load my YAML if I've got a couple different languages in a yes. stack. And I know that- What are your two languages? Well, say I've got Node and Java. Okay. And they have slight differences in how they load my YAML files, but I could use YAML script and in both of them. They'll load exactly the same. Cool. Yeah. And Just confirming that I understood that. Node and Java will be done by the end of the month. So there's cool. seven bindings. Actually, I have a PR for Java and um, Node was the next one to do. So my plan is to have 42 languages. That's always my goal. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the, this tag, without this tag at the top, um, nothing magical will happen. And no YAML scripts or YAML file in the world has this tag, I would imagine. It would be really weird if it did. Um, <clears throat> And weird if people are using my YAML. Yeah, it doesn't. So, <laughs> yeah, but after you use that tag, you can, um, you can at any node, you can decide, you know, you have your regular YAML and you're like, oh, I just actually want to actually curl in a file here and pull a piece out of it out and merge it with this other thing that I pulled out of this database and whatever. You can do all that, no problem. Um, so, yeah, it, and I work very hard to have a clean syntax, powerful features, and the power is coming from closer. So um, I imagine that after, if this becomes popular, people will do other things with it. It is a general purpose programming language. You can write um, programs and libraries in it. I want people to write libraries that easily, I'm working on tooling so that you write a library and it can make into a um, native binary shared library that has the tooling to automatically bind it into 42 languages. So, um, but that's a bit of work. Um, yeah, so I, it's just like closure with a YAML syntax, but actually it's like Babashka. Who, raise your hand if you've used Babashka. Almost everybody that does closure day-to-day -day uses Babashka. And um, I learned about it, and I learned that it was an alternate way to do bash scripting. And, and I love bash scripting, so I'm like, I'll just stay away from Babashka. Then all of the questions that I had to get this done were from Mikhail Borkent, who wrote Babashka. And so I asked him questions, I annoyed the heck out of him probably every day. <laughs> and um, and then I realized, wait, I'm actually just building Babashka because all of the the result, the, the YS command that we're running is just like the BB command with a different syntax. Um, it's amazing how similar it is. And I'm seeing all the stuff that I can steal from Babashka now. So <laughs> we'll see that more. OK, so let's get into this. Um, Actually, this is going to be a review of, of YAML itself. I'm not sure what's happening here. Uh... Thank you. Do you want to take a second to plug the, your um, Vim-based presentation software? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what slide are we on? <clears throat> Oh, I have the caps lock key was on. That was the problem. I think maybe, uh, maybe it wasn't. So we'll skip 10. I'm gonna skip nine. Okay, there we go. All right. All right, so here's just, uh, I know everybody knows YAML, but you don't really know YAML, so I'll just go over it again. <laughs> um, this is a comment. Here's a mapping, um, keys and value pairs separated by a colon space. Um, this tick doesn't mean anything. Everything is just a text string without quotes. Almost everything doesn't need quotes. Um, this is just another key. Um, and this is a sequence. So the dashes mean it's a, a vector or an array or um, a sequence of things. Uh, this uh, vector has um, a string and then a mapping as its two values. And one very important thing is in YAML, there's five scalar styles. Plain is what we call plain scalar, has no quotes. Um, and this is very important for all of the code that's executable in, in YAML script is plain scalars. Um, double quoted and single quoted scalars are strings, which is kind of weird because a tick is a quoting character, but we'll see how we deal with that. Um, the folded scalar is the, probably the, the one I hate. I like the least, like the most, like the least. <laughs> um, but the literal scalar is the one I like the most. So this is like a here document. Um, 
it, all you do is indent and you can put any text um, in that. So, so Ingi, this, this, um, you were saying the ticks don't mean anything. So you're the, the syntax highlighting and would be a, an example of a YAML loading working strangely in work. a particular language. This is a terrible syntax highlighter, and I apologize for it. So <laughs> the one that's on my, yeah, there's no good YAML. Okay. I haven't seen, at least on Vim, I haven't seen any good. That's why we just avoid doing things that scare the highlighter, the syntax highlighter. <laughs> gotcha. Is this the vanilla Vim syntax highlighter, or is it like when you download? I don't even know which one it is. <laughs> I just, yeah. It's annoying. Sorry. I should probably fix that before my big open source North America. Do I need to know the difference between a folded and a literal scalar? No, or... just don't never use the folded one. Okay. Always <laughs> use the right. There you go. Okay. Fine. Um, yeah, so, and we can actually load that file with YAML scripts. We just, and it just, um, so the, the result of a, a load is, is JSON. And this is just a compact JSON blob of what that was. Um, the YS command has, this is a slightly more readable form. If you wanted to make it really readable, you could pipe it to JQ, of course. And then you know you can have it load as YAML. So this actually got read in. You can notice there's no comments. It got read in as YAML script and written out as, as YAML. Um, and that actually means it was compiled to closure. And then that closure was turned into JSON. So it actually went through the whole YAML script compiling in the closure code, which just happened to be like EDN kind of like data structure, but it was actually fully compiled um, and pretty fast. Um, okay, and then these are the more esoteric things. So you have these two tags are directives. These are the only directives, YAML and, and tag, and um, nobody ever uses these. Um, here you have an anchor and um, and then, so that's kind of like a, an address, and this is a pointer to an address, anchors and aliases. Also, YAML has the flow styles, so that look like JSON. In fact, I was saying before, um, all JSON, every bit of JSON is valid YAML, despite what you might read on Hacker News somewhere. Um, it's, we've actually figured out there's no known use case for valid YAML, or JSON is not valid YAML. So, yeah. Um, and then also the weird thing is this, there's three YAML documents in one file. So YAML supports multiple documents in one stream or file. And this is going to be actually really useful for some uh, stuff that I'm going to show later. Um, and that's about it. So the dot, dot, dot is just a way to say I'm done with, imagine you had like, you were sending out YAML on a pipe, but like you only sent like a document every hour. So this says, well, I'm done. So the other things say, okay, I got this. I'll process it and wait for the next one to come. So otherwise you wouldn't, you'd have to wait for the start of the next one. It's kind of a, anyway, that's just a part of YAML. The, the, the three dots, you don't really see it much, but um, the three dashes you'll see sometimes at the beginning of one file. You don't need it if there's only one document in the file. Um, anyway, so now you know YAML. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so this is really important. Um, the YAML load stack. So a YAML loader, and that's why I corrected you, parser is just one layer of a stack of, depending on how you count, four to seven um, dis distinct um, transitions that uh, go through to take text to become native memory. And then a dump is what we call the process of going from native memory to text. And that also has parallel transitions that go the other way. Um, so read and scan are usually just considered part of parse. That's not very important. But parse, compose, resolve, and construct are how uh, full stack YAML loaders are implemented. And the parser is the really hard part. It takes like months to write up. I mean, it took me six months to write the very first one that actually passed the test suite. Like we have this test suite and none of them, now I think we have, what, Tina, four? I think there's four none. The Rust guy just got it past the whole test suite. So um, yeah, it's writing a, a valid YAML parser is a really big task. And I didn't do that for a YAML script. I just used someone else's. The rest of the code I wrote myself. Um, <laughs> oh, it's the only way to do it. <laughs> um, that's really good. Right. So um, let's, let's play around with the YS uh, DLI. So 
Um, if you just run it by itself, it prints the help. Um, or you can run the help command. Uh, this gives the version. I just put out this version this afternoon, 0141, and it's got some cool new stuff in it. We'll see. Um, here's our favorite little song. To run that. Um, and so the minus print flag. So we actually ran that program, but we actually evaluated it too. So it produced an evaluation answer at the end. So this will actually print that evaluation answer, which is nil. That's what usually a lot of functions is just whatever the last statement returned. But sometimes you want to know what that is, um, depending on the code that you're writing. Um, and then compile, we've already seen that just turns it into closer. Okay, it's pretty simple stuff. So let's talk about running versus loading. So I realized there's two things that, like actually nobody wants to write code in YAML yet. I think there will be reasons and people will come around and they'll see how cool it is. But um, right now people just want their YAML loaders to do more stuff. I mean, we get requests, it's like, hey, you, YAML can merge mappings, two mappings. Um, there's a way to do it and it should have never have been in the spec, but it, Clark got it in there somehow and then some people have implemented it, some people haven't. Um, but then other people were like, hey, I actually want to concatenate vectors. And I'm like, well, we're not going in that direction really. Now you can do all of this with, I mean, you have the full power closure, so you can do all of that. Um, so running and loading are the exact same thing, but they two different mindsets. They both compile to closure in a ballot with um, SCI, which is the, the, the closure interpreter that I'm using. We'll, See that more. It's the small closure interpreter, also written by Mikhail Borkin, the Babashka guy. And actually, Babashka is just a layer over uh, Psi as well. Um, so running is about the side effects, printing stuff, and um, loading is just about the resulting thing. And that print thing just gave us the result at the end. Um, right. I already told you, plain data is, goes through all the same processes that his code does. So. Um, We'll get some code that I think the boring stuff is almost over there, Eric. Um, let's see. Okay, so are you not entertained? <laughs> Thoroughly. <laughs> uh, here I'm going to open two files, um, two YAML script files that interact. So on the left, um, we we have the magic tag at the beginning, and it has this extra thing at the end, data. So this is saying, okay, start with everything being data. So this is just going to be the word range. But then the double colon says, hey, switch over and make this thing be code. So we're going to generate the numbers 10 through 15. And then um, we'll go back. This is just the word mapping. Uh, this is just the word foo. This is just the word bar. Um, just the word baz. But then say, hey, flip back over and, and increment 41. You know, just add 1 to 41. So I want to do that. And then here, we don't have a double colon. So we can just use a bang to flip over to code mode or, and say, Okay, let's load this other file. Let's load this as YAML script. Um, even though it's just YAML, it's still YAML script because every YAML file is a YAML script file. So we're going to pull in that data, but let's just take the names out of it. We don't really care about the things. We just want the names. And then take the first two and then add Bill and Ted on there because you always want Bill and Ted. So um, let's. So this is just loading bar by itself. There's um, things and names. And then let's load foo and get all of the data. We'll put it through JQ, just make it pretty. And we'll see down at the bottom, we get Alice and Bob, the first two, plus Bill and Ted to make it fun. Okay. And then we have you know all these, there's it as JSON, there's it as YAML, et cetera. And EDN. So EDN is closer's own little JSON, uh, as it were. It's just a... Um, data in closure code because Lisp, that's kind of important because code is data. So, you know, that, is that data or code? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. So here's where everybody can install this. If you went to that page I showed you earlier, you already have YS installed. Um, I'm going to actually run this. So this is kind of cool. I made a thing where if you're using Bash or Zed Shell, so we called it in Canada, Z shell <laughs> or Z. -sh. Um, so the, you'll see this quite a bit. I have a, uh, a less than sign and uh, some parens. 
Um, I don't know if people know about that in Bash. Basically, it runs the thing in the middle and makes it into a file and returns the file name. So the the command just sees that as a file with whatever the contents of the command you ran in it, which is pretty cool. So I want to source this thing I'm going to pull down from the internet. Um, and what this is going to do is I source it because it's not a separate process. And so I can actually make a temp directory, install it in there, and add that to my path and have it work right away. But as soon as that shell dies, that path goes away, and then it's just sitting in the temp until the next time temp gets cleaned up. So um, let's do it. Yeah, and so and then I print out some little useful things you can try because you're just trying this, playing around with this for the first time. So I installed it into some temp directory. Um, 041 is the latest version, and here's some commands you could run until your shell goes away, which is right now. Okay, that shell is gone. Um, this is the way to install it permanently. And by permanently, I mean, if you run it as root, it will install in user local bin. If you install it not as root, it will install it under home.local bin and lib. So it installed two things. It installed the YS thing we've been using and also lib YAML script, is, which is bound to Python and other languages so that you can use this as a loader. Um, 42 languages. Soon. Yes, soon, very soon. Um, I, I think I missed it on that slide, but I actually wrote a package manager. I think I'm up to 38. So I wrote a wrapper around package managers so you could just learn one interface and publish code to any of 42 languages. You know, as long as you have the account signed up for and configured, you could just say, you know, it's, just, it's PST. So PST release, whatever language. Is it a package manager manager? Yeah, it's a meta package manager. Did you ever, have you ever met a package manager? Um, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and then you can change the prefix. You can also change the version with capital version here um, to install the versions. And on Linux, sometimes the libc's on different operating systems don't quite work yet. I, uh, the best Babeska guy, told me how to fix it, but I haven't yet. So building from source is really easy. You just type in make install after you clone it. And you don't have to have anything installed. It it, it does two downloads into temp. Um, and that one of the downloads has Java and everything needed in that one thing. And I just point a variable at that and it all works. And your system isn't any of the wiser. So that's really cool. Um, OK, a little more stuff to put you to sleep. Um, anyway. Rich Hickey is the guy um, who invented Closer. Everybody knows that except these three guys. So, I, okay. He's, a, he's an awesome dude. I, 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 I'm not speaking for him. I've never met him. I've never talked to him. But I have watched a lot of his stuff and, I, um, and read a bunch of his stuff. And this is my take on what he did for programming. He fixed Java, essentially, in two words. Um, he was working in Java and C++, I read. For, for about 20 years and just got fed up with it eventually. And all the like, you know, he's a great programmer, but um, it's just always fighting him every step of the way. So he took two years off and uh, created a programming language um, that fixed these things. And the way it did that is it made Java, which is, you know, it's, it's good, I guess, but I mean, it's popular. <laughs> um, the JVM's great, um, but it's, yeah, he made it into, he spent the most time up front making immutable data structures on which he could build a functional programming language. So you could do functional programming, but in this language everybody else is using non-functionally, um, he made it both ways interoperable. So anything written in Java can be used from Clojure and vice versa. And then he fixed concurrency so that it wasn't ever a headache. There's no locks to worry about. It's just, I, I haven't even gotten into concurrency, but I imagine you guys have, is that right? That's amazing. amazing. Yeah, like using futures. And it, it's simple, right? Atoms, yeah. I just started I, using atoms a little bit. You know, I tried to stay away from them because they're not uh, immutable, but like um, now it's, I could see where to use them appropriately. Okay, so back up. Uh, so he used Lisp, which I think is a good decision. It's a well understood syntax model, but I don't know if he had to use that. Um, but at the end of the day, Closure makes programming better, I think. Um, and hats off to, to Rich for, for doing that. Um, I think that Lisp is not the important thing. I think a lot of people get into Closure and they're super into the Lisp way, and that's cool. Um, but it's a good way to write programs. I've been doing it every day for the last 
eight months and it, there's good stuff about it, but most programmers don't know it. And so it's kind of a, a hard sell. So um, I just kind of say that as, you know, even though YAML script is all closer, it breaks away from the syntax quite a bit. Um, so, and some people might not like that. I don't know. I also want to talk about uh, Jeremy asking us. Um, so I was super into CoffeeScript about 10 or 12 years ago. And I, I still, if I was going to do something in JavaScript, I would likely, you know, that binding I'm going to write for Node, I'll probably write it in CoffeeScript. Um, it writes better JavaScript than I can write. Hell yeah. Uh I feel like CoffeeScript taught us to be better JavaScript programmers. Well, it taught more than us. It taught the main the 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 people who wrote the spec for ES 2015, 2016. He, I mean, they took half of his ideas from CoffeeScript, and they should have taken all of them, <laughs> right? Hell yeah. I mean, and so he just took the best things from all the languages, and it's it's the, the code is so clean. Um, yeah. So I kind of like would like to think that I'm trying to do for YAML in a sense in spirit what, what Rich and Jeremy did for other languages. Um, just take them, make them a more pleasurable thing to work in. And like just saying that having the same set of bugs in every language would be a good thing, like we were talking about earlier. Um, that's just one thing, but like adding all this power. Um, in in a nice way. I mean, you could try to throw another language in there, and it could be gross. And that, but we'll see. I hope you find that it looks really good. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm hoping this is a gateway for YAML users to find Closure, and then they'll find all these other great things that Closure offers, and it'll be right there in in their YAML if they want it. Um, okay, so let's dive into that first example. I said I would. Okay, let's go through this kind of line by line. Remember the magic tag. If you use this um, hash bang for a script, you don't have to use the tag. This is, um, but you can't just say what ys. You have to say ys dash zero, and you'll notice the the bang yaml script had a slash v zero. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's basically future proofing it. I'll talk about it now. Um, once v zero is stable and declared stable, just like closure, it will never change. But I knew that I couldn't do it right from the beginning. And people would start using this as soon as they found out about it and found it useful. So this gives me a way to go to V1. I'll try to make it a lot similar, but like all of their content, anything that you wrote that has V0 in it will continue to work forever. And that's the point, right? So I made the hash bang also have to have the YS dash zero. And when I install YS, it actually installs, you'll see later, three things. It's, uh, it installs YS dash zero, 0.1, 0.41, and then ys dash zero and ys are sim links to that. So, um, okay, let's go. To, so now we define the main function. Main gets called automatically, um, and we can see down at the bottom. I have an apply main args, and args is a special variable that the command line arguments in it because just um, asterisk command dash line dash args <laughs> earmuff is just too long. So I just made it arcs. Um, and so anyway, yeah, so this automatically gets called. Now look what happens here. I have a default like you would in say um, in Python, number equals 99. So if you don't call it with a number, it'll assume 99. Well, look what I did over here. I generated code that was a multi-arity um, function definition. So called with one arg, it will do this, and that's the main thing. Uh, but called with zero args, it will call the one with one arg. With the number 99. Simple, right? So, um, and you can have any expressions here. I mean, and you can have as many arguments as, as you want. Although, I believe like once you use a default, you have to use defaults for the rest of them. It has to be in that kind of. Where is the, where is each coming from? Because that's not a built in closure. Great question. And then that's the next line. It's just, oh, it's, okay. <laughs> so, each is really do seek. So I was running these things with four, and I'm like, it's not printing anything. And I'm like, well, it's lazy, and that was the. Uh, <laughs> so I, I switched to DSync, and I'm like, I'm not going to introduce somebody brand new to YAML script to D O S E Q when I can just say each. So each wasn't really used in. Um, so, so there are some replacement things, like say is the next one. I I just can't type print line. It's just like I don't even know how to spell it. So, um, yeah. So say is is 
does the same thing. So you could use do seek here and, and print line here. And that'd do be the, the same. I was gonna say, do those come from some prelude somewhere that we're not seeing, or is it? That's correct. Yeah, it comes form? from the, the YAML script standard library. So like you said prelude, which is great. So in closure, there's closure.core, which is effectively the prelude. It gets mixed into every namespace, referred, they call it, in closure. So um, this actually, the YS, um, dot std um, gets mixed into the closure core and then that gets referred into everything. So say ends up into in every namespace automatically. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next big thing is, so this is another function call. This is weird because we I actually could have typed this. I could have just typed this like normal closure. So the, the one cool thing is you can go full Lisp or you can go anti-Lisp as much as you want, you can use this. Um, it kind of supports both. I mean, if you're in this general YAML form, either of those would compile the same, but um, we'll see later. All I'm doing is switching in the word that's next to a parenthesis onto the other side of the parenthesis. And that's the way uh, people are usually used to calling functions. And I didn't want to make it too weird. Here, anything beginning with a dollar sign in either a double quoted string or a literal, a literal is where you see the, bent, or the, the pipe here. Um, is an interpolation. And we don't have interpolations in closure. We just use the stir function and it joins all of the things together, right? So, um, but if you call a symbol followed by parens, that's a, that, that would be a method call. And if you want to just put the, the paren up front, you can actually put any expression within a dollar or parens, any expression, or you can just have dollar word um, and that works as well. And yeah, like dollar n down here, just a plain word. And I think that's about it. The only difference is, oh yeah, this uh, arrow just kind of disappears. It means most thing, we'll get more into that later. Sorry. Were there any questions on that, by the way? We're pretty good. The obvious stuff, okay. Um, Okay, yeah, so I started this in, in the summer of 2022. I came up with the idea of YAML script. I'm like, oh, that's a cool name, great name, great idea. I put out some modules and then I like let it sleep until the end of the year. And then I'm like, oh, I gotta get back into this thing. Okay, it's definitely gonna be a Lisp. You think you know what a Lisp is. It's like parents with a function at the beginning, but you don't really know what a Lisp is. So you better read up about this. So I actually just asked the internet, um, how do I make a Lisp? And amazingly, this is what the internet told me. I asked the internet how to make a Lisp and it gave me this project called Make a Lisp. And then I went to the guide and I love the first sentence. It says, see, so you want to write a Lisp interpreter, welcome. <laughs> and then it gives you 11 steps and each of these steps has like 100 to 200 tests that you have to pass. And, um, but it, it's, it's, it's a gentle guide and it took me two weeks to learn through it. And um, at the end, I had a working Lisp and they, they've actually written, there's 90, in, no, there's probably over 100 implementations in here. I think they stopped taking pull requests. Um, but there's, and probably in over 75 unique languages, there was already a Perl one, and I did mine in Perl. But, um, and then after I was done, I decided to want to keep going. So I'm like, I'm going to implement the rest of Closure in Perl. That's what I'm going to do. And I, I'm going to call it Lingi. I've had that name for a long time. I'm like, this is what I'll call Lingi. And then I signed up to give a talk at the Pearl Conference in Toronto in July. And I'm like, I'll give a talk called Lingi and YAML script. And that was funny. So YAML script was just this toy that sat over Lingi, but Lingi was the big thing. And then I went there and then Peter, this is your big moment, um, got noticed by Peter Stromberg um, of uh, Calva fame, has on, um, and he's sitting right there. And Woo. it's three and three something in the morning. Hey, Peter. And he was the greatest guy. I mean, he was just the model member of the community. He invited me in, showed me which channels to join, who to talk to, how to make my int introduce myself, got me going. We worked on a project together to integrate my stuff with his stuff for a week, and then I never heard from him again. But <laughs> <laughs> but I do, uh, no, we, we talk once in a while. Um, anyway, and that community was just like Peter. Everybody, like, I think they just set up a rule be nice or get kicked out because everybody's just nice. And that doesn't happen in communities ever. <laughs> um, so 
really hats off to um, Peter. You're you're a maintainer on that on that Slack, right? You're one of the police, I think. Is that right? Yeah, one of the admin, admin team. Yeah. Yeah. So he can be mean if you if you're if you're wrong him, but I guess <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so this is where I met all these people. And then I learned about Graalbian and Sai, and I'm like, wait, Lingi doesn't matter. YAML script's a big deal because I can actually make this into a full-blown language for everyone in a month. And now it's been eight months later, but you know, there's a lot of little things to do, but all the big pieces were there. Um, if I was a little bit better closer programmer, that would be great. Uh, but I'm getting those code reviews from you guys, so it'll become good fest. Okay. Okay. So this is a key thing about YAML script. There's three modes. We talked about this a bit earlier. I said, well, right here we're in string, then we use the double colon, we go over to code mode. So yeah, I call these modes data mode and code mode, and you switch back and forth. But if you don't start with that magic tag, you're in bear mode, which means you can never switch to code mode. You're just basically in data mode forever, and that's called bear mode. Um, so yeah, if you don't use the magic tag, you're stuck in bear mode. Otherwise, you can switch back and forth between data mode and code mode. So you're either in plain old YAML, or you're executing closure at any point. Um, yeah, so all of the existing YAML files are bare mode files. Um, you put this up at the top, and then you're in code mode. Same with this one, except instead of starting in code mode, you start in data mode. So adding slash data to the end just says, I want the same abilities, but I'm going to start with my YAML being YAML. And then until I switch it, it will be YAML. Um, putting a bang in front of any node turns does a it, it toggles it between if you're in code mode it goes to data mode data mode to code mode but i'm like the bangs look kind of ugly so at least for uh, mapping pairs which is the most common stuff i said double colon just having a colon as the last argument of the key is really what you're doing um it's not a i'm not changing the yaml syntax it just looks like i am so like yeah actually if you put like colon space space colon it would do the same thing because all the spaces would be trimmed off the the plain string there um, okay, so let's look at these three files. Here we uh, we have bare data and and code. And so this one doesn't have any tag; it's just a bare file. Um, this one over here is a person with their age, and but now we made the age random. They're going to be somewhere between twenty one and eighty. And but they always like poker and cycling, whereas this one is kind of the same. Except now their hobbies are random. We're just gonna take these hobbies, shuffle them, and take the first two. Um, and we're going to switch their names between Jack and Joe. OK, great. So let's see what happens. OK, so if we load the bear mode, we're always going to get Jill 42 poker cycling. We just, we're stuck. If we do it in a data mode, we get the same thing, except Jill's age keeps bouncing all over the place. It's got a young Jill, 23-year-old uh, Jill, best Jill. Okay. Let's go to code mode. OK, so now we got Jill 69 archery and exercising. Wait, we got Jill 38 formula one racing and gaming. Jill again. Somehow we get more Jills than Jacks. Jill 27 darts and gaming. Ah, now we got Jack 66 archery and bowling. There we go. So I don't know if there's any good use case for that, but there probably is. Probably want some. Um, random data once in a while. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so let's, now we're going to talk about the syntax of the YAML script a, a bit. So um, this is why I taught you YAML earlier. Um, there's block mappings, and so there's block collection. A collection is either a mapping or a sequence, and a sequence to closure people is a is a vector. Um, I know you have sequences too. So that's the same thing. And um, block means the indented stuff or the dashes stuff. And then flow means the JSON looking stuff, the square braces and the curly braces. Um, and then scalars are always just strings or numbers or nulls or booleans or whatever. Um, so in code mode, I don't allow block, I don't allow the dashes block sequences. I saw there wasn't any real need for them. And I, I thought it would be really good to see anytime you see dashes, you know you're in data mode because they're not allowed in code mode. It's not code. The only thing you have to be 
in a Mac, it should be pretty obvious whether if you just look in the middle of a file, what mode you're in. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and no flow stuff. So any of the JSON looking stuff is not allowed in code mode. Um, there's no use for it. No anchors or aliases in code mode either. Um, but all this stuff works the same as it does in YAML in, in data mode. Okay, so plain scalars are treated as code. Um, the quoted and literal scalars are treated as strings. Actually, the quoted literal and folded scalars are treated as strings, but don't use the folded ones. Uh, and then the double quoted and the literal are interpolated. You can put dollar signs in front of the, the single ticks and the folded, so you, and a dollar sign is a dollar sign. So let's... Okay. Um, so I'm going to run this code, and it has a, this is a block sequence, right? The dash, it's not allowed. So what happens? Oh, we see, it's not allowed. Sequences, block and flow, not allowed in code mode. So we got an error, not the prettiest error, but um, this one was okay, but we were in code mode, and we had the symbol foo, and foo doesn't mean anything. Oops. Um, okay, this one looks just fine. We're going to say the word bar. OK, that works. So here, um, bar was a string, so we just set a string. And then in this one, we have some interpolation going on. As we know, ENV is the entire environment. And I'm going to pull out the user, which is me, Ingi. So it says, hello, Ingi. Right? So this is actually grabbing the environment variables. And this is how you can access. Um, this is a mapping, and this is a key. And so um, dot accessing, which is common in a lot of languages. Okay. Um, right. So I wanted to say a bunch of different ways to say hello. So there's more than one way to do it, like in Perl, Tim Tauti. Um, so, but basically, what it is is it's mapping pairs where the things uh, an expression in closure is um, a function and arguments within parens. If you imagine a paren at either end of this and the colon taken away, then this is um, the thing. So and it doesn't really matter where the colon is. We'll see these all compile of the same thing. Also, I said before, if there's an arrow on the left-hand side, we throw it away, but then we have to use the, the parens ourselves. And I said before, these two are the same. So let's, and I'm just returning nil, so it, you'll see why. Um, so let me go ahead and compile this. Okay, those were all the same, right? So we'll go back in and look. And I just, this plus, plus, plus is um, a way of taking the final value and passing it on to the next stage, um, which we'll see more in a bit. Um, so if I go back into here and I look, the only thing that was weird is why is there a dot in here? Well, we'll get to that in a second. But if without a dot, that's invalid YAML. Can you see why? Because we have this string here, but then we have something after it. It's... YAML doesn't allow that. Once you're at the end of a string, you have to go to a new line. There's... So what I did here was I put a dot, which doesn't mean anything. It's an escaping mechanism. It made all of this a plain string where the double quotes were just another character, right? So this is just all text. It's just if I put in single quotes around this whole thing, right? So yeah, so the, anytime you see a dot at the beginning of something, it's just to mean this whole thing is a string, even though it looks like YAML syntax. I have to escape it because I really want it to be closures, stuff that will compile into closure syntax code mode. Um, OK, so going to, and we run it, and it prints hello, Bob, several times. Um, yeah, and so this is just straight closure code. This is actually, I mean, you can validate everything between the single ticks is that's a closure statement, right? So we we do this, and um, it works. The minus minus closure flag says, take this code and run it through YAML script, so you can use say and all that kind of stuff, which isn't a part of closure or bash or anything. But the code that's coming in, don't compile it. It's already code closure. And so this is just useful sometimes. Like you can compile something and pipe it to another thing and you know maybe tweak it beforehand, that kind of thing. So. <laughs> Somebody is not muted? Yeah, somebody might not be muted. OK. Oh, I see. Um, here's some key differences. This is where you 
might gag, but there's good reasons um, for the closer people. So <clears throat> characters in closer are slash and then the character, and then there's a handful, 10 or so words like new line and tab that you put a slash and that's how you get those characters. Um, I wanted the slash, the backslash for a general escaping mechanism. So I made double backslash how you do the same things, but that's how you do characters in, in YAML script. And to be honest, I don't know, but I don't use characters almost ever in my closure code. Do you guys? No. Yeah, nobody does, right? So um, the other thing is, this is a weird one, but I needed the dot, and dots are namespace separators. So I use double colon. Um, so whenever you have a namespace, you're going to have to, like, it would be closer double colon core, which is just going to feel weird at first, but that's how it is. Um, the slash I kept, I didn't at first. I tried to make this a dot too, but it didn't work out. Um, so this is a threading thing. So instead of doing kind of in list, you got to do everything in reverse, you know, kind of got to. That was either a bomb, a really big gun, or. Is this sports? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there's a large uh, bang outside for those of you watching at yeah. home. <laughs> there's some explosion outside. We seem to be alive. OK. So um, in threading, this is how you would do threading in, in, in YAML script. And I call it smart threading because Y can either be a, a keyword or it can be a string. Um, and there's some other smart things that happen in here. And you can always do this. You could do the stuff on the left. That'll work. That'll work too. Um, but this is more idiomatic way to do things. Okay. Um, pound doesn't really work out, or octothorpe, if you like to call it that, doesn't work out so well since it's a YAML con uh, comment. So I don't really have any, I don't support any of these. So for um, this is an anonymous function. I use backslash. And also, I wanted the percent sign to be a modulus operator like it should be like God intended it to be. So um, in here, this just means percent one in, in closure. It just means it's a, I didn't declare the variable. I just called this function. So whatever was the first argument, put it. So instead of percent one, you can say percent. Um, you can't do that in the script. You have to say percent one. But then you can say a modulus three. And actually that's a rem three. There's a rem and a mod and they're weirdly different. I'll, you'll see the difference. It only involves negative numbers. Really weird. There's a whole page that I read on the internet about, about how everybody handles these. Anyway, um, here's a regex. This is how you do regexes. And I just used uh, kind of the old Perl way with the slashes. Um, everything inside is still the same. I don't have the flags at the end. You just have to do it like you do in closer. Um, strings. I didn't, I didn't do this right away, but then I realized I really need to keep strings are single quoted or double quoted in YAML. They have to work that way in YAML script. It's just going to be too weird. So if you want, if you have a symbol and you want to treat it as a symbol and not turn it into its value in list or closure, you put a, a tick in front of it and that's quoting it. It's called, um, it's calling the quote um, function or macro on that. And this is how you just use the backslash, which I used as the general purpose escaping thing. So that's kind of my meta out for everything. Comments, actually, you can use um, semicolons still. Um, but you, of course, I can't prevent you from using YAML comments because they're this is YAML. It really is. I mean, the YAML parser I stole off the internet. So I didn't change it. It's just nothing can get past that parser and be valid YAML script. Um, Peter has a hand up. Question. Oh, Peter. Oh, Tom's here. Great. Peter had a question. Uh, yep. Oh. Yeah. So I saw you used the uh, slashes like the Perl way for 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 um, for regexes. Yeah. Uh, uh, if I recall correctly, in Perl you could you could choose your delimiters for regexes, right? You could use That's something right. else. Yeah. Well, you can always. Do you support always... that? No. No, I'm just, I'm not, I mean, Larry kind of went off the rails on that. He's like, you can define your own quoting operator. It's like a little bit. So I'm not, I'm not trying to, yeah. I'm trying to make it as simple as I can until it becomes popular and then I can do crazier things. I don't know. Um, 
Anyway, good question. Thanks. Um, okay, so that's another thing. YAML script only allows a sane set of symbols. Like you can use any characters to make symbols in Lisp. It's just nuts. But if you look in Closure Core, and I have, they only use words and dashes. And sometimes they have a, a quest, one question mark or a bang at the end. And that's it. Closure Core. That's the standard library. It doesn't use any of these crazy things. And um, YAML script just doesn't allow it. But by not allowing it, then I got all of these other characters that I could use in other ways, which was great. Um, yeah, so I allow alphanumeric words separated by dash. Um, I don't allow underscores except for underscore itself, because that's a really, it's handy for a couple of things. We've already saw it where it's a placeholder for how to thread um, something, whether the argument went, instead of going first, it went last or in the middle or whatever. Um, and a lot of people, you will use this as a, a dummy argument, and I wanted to support that. Um, so underscore is allowed as a symbol. Um, yeah, so let's run this code. This is, this is one thing that people tend to use. Um, it's like, if you wanted to convert foo to bar, you would name your function foo arrow bar. It's cute. Or you could just call it foo dash two dash bar that were to, and that would be uh, probably more understandable. But anyway, yeah, so that's just not allowed. Basically, what I do is I parse anything that is a valid closure symbol first. So I do actually accept them all, and then I'm like, wait. So anything that you've used before that you're expecting to use will flag an error. It's not like I, I you know, I'm like, oh, that's a valid symbol. Take it. And I'm like, oh, it's not a valid uh, YAML script symbol. Would Talk. you consider adding the uh, angle bracket at all to one of the list of sane symbols? Because we use that all the that's time in our code. Be fun. Yeah, for uh, like maps. If you have a, a map between one thing and another thing, you'll say like thing I, one, arrow, I, thing I, two. I would consider it. <laughs> yeah, I would consider it. Um, that's probably, yeah, the one I, I, right. I don't have the experience of seeing a lot of, of uh, programming closer for other people day to day. So, and I have seen it here and there, but I'm like, it doesn't seem really popular. But if you say it's popular, Crazy. it's popular. All right. Yeah, people everywhere. Yeah. It'll be added tomorrow. You got awesome. It. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> that could be your first PR to yeah. the actually. Yeah, some, exactly. You should make an issue on that. Yeah. The YAML script community is so responsive. That's one thing I've really noticed mm -hmm. about YAML script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can talk to the main dude. Yeah. And he's just like, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And Peter, I didn't really have a Peter has a hand up again. Peter. Do you want enough? Do you want to, do you have some feature requests? Yeah. Yeah. I want to second that uh, about uh, the mappings. But I had a question about the underscore. Yeah, I think it's often used to to mark um, not used arguments as well. So you start uh, yeah, I, a symbol. Yeah, I, I did, I did say that. Like, if you had a list of parameters but you weren't going to use one, you'd use an underscore, and then um, Condo won't flag it or whatever. Yeah, it doesn't get flagged as an unused argument, that kind of thing. So I definitely wanted to. Yeah, I use it all the time in my code too. So I'm like, need that. Um, oh, I also see uh, Andrew has a hand up. Oh, Andrew Pam. Oh, Andrew Pam is a guy I work with. He lives in, in Melbourne, Australia. This is awesome. Oh, wow. Um, Tom yeah. is from Buffalo. Did Tom leave? Tom might have left. Nope, oh, Tom is still here. Oh, there's Tom. Okay, great. Yeah, this doesn't show the full. He lives in Berlin, which is crazy. Greg is in, in Buffalo. You're in Buffalo, Greg? Actually, know everybody here. I'm not sure who Matt I is. I'm not sure who Boardroom is, but <laughs> Andrew, what's your question? Yeah, I put this in the comments, but um, uh, I, I, you know, it's great that you've uh, Tim Tattied a few things, but I, it, it slightly offends me that you haven't Tim Tattied the regex markers because, as I put in the comments, the big problem is when you have regexes that contain slashes, those get really ugly really quick if the if the actual regex delimiter is also a slash. You end up with backslash slash backslash slash, which looks bad. Hey, make, make an issue for it on, on, on GitHub. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, because yeah, that, that kind of hurts readability. And it's it's unfortunately a really common case. If you're trying to match, you know, HTML or something and uh, and you have to go HTTP colon backslash slash backslash slash all over the place, that's that's just awful. Yeah, I agree. Are you really parsing HTML with regex? 
Well, hopefully not. <laughs> I mean, hopefully it's the year 2024. And we're hopefully still the same applies to um, file path, the because again, the file path separator, you should not be assuming that the file path separator is a slash. So you're right. Um, that's actually <laughs> not the right way to do it. But it doesn't mean that people don't do it when they're in a hurry. And you, sometimes you want your system to support people who want to do a quick a quick hack. Well, maybe that's bad. Maybe you shouldn't shouldn't be enabling people who want to do hacks. But, uh, but yeah. <laughs> My, my point stands think, that it would be nice to have at least one other way to do regexes that, that, that isn't slashes. I, I don't know what ahead. that would be, but it would be nice to have at least one ultimate. I want to go into some code here. I forgot to write a slide on this. And so I watched a talk. There's a there's a, a closure thing called Jank for C++, right? And the guy's been working on it for eight years. Oh, yeah. And I saw his talk on it, and he said, I used to use regex to parse closure, and everybody in the audience laughed. Rightly. No, <laughs> wrongly. So, well, I, I use it and, it and check this out. One regex parses all of closure, and that's the regex, <laughs> right? And so, and this regex awesome. is composed by, so these are combinated regexes, all composed oh, from. Oh, my God. From these pieces, which are also combinated from other little pieces, so very easy to understand and maintain. And so I, I would say I don't parse; I lex. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really doing BNF written as a regex, which is kind of a okay way to use regex. Is you're not the only one. <laughs> and it, and it, and it's and I'm 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 perfectly fine with going to a, you know a grammar driven thing, but I'm not going to just do it because somebody tells me I have to. <laughs> The regex is working fantastically well, and I don't. I, I do that in Calvas. I don't even loop. I do. This is one regex application per string. Awesome. Lex is the entire string perfectly. Yep. Does the, does the bracket matching work for arbitrary depth? I was just going to ask that too. <laughs> so th this is the one thing that I do have to rewrite. No, there's a, for balanced parens, <laughs> and this is because I remember of, proving in school you can't do that. <laughs> no, you can in certain languages that have the ability to. Perl can do it, um, although you get messed up when you're using more than parens when you have balanced other things. Anyway, but Java cannot. You have to do so. This is like five or six levels deep <laughs> of balanced parens, and it's easily breakable. Um, and I have so many little things to do that it's just it's getting by until somebody yeah. files a bug. Yeah. <laughs> more friends will continue yeah. until morale improves. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, statement was more friends will continue until morale improves. Okay. If you need, no one would ever need more than five friends. Right? <laughs> exactly. Think of it. Think of it as a safety measure that encourages you to write uh, clean, clean code that doesn't go too deep. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, you can just pull a go and say that it's a it's a feature. Right. <laughs> Version two will support seven levels of nested friends. <laughs> wow. Uh, so well, what about closer? It has. Have you ever looked at the code that calls functions? No. Twenty arguments. They have one for one, one for two. <laughs> it's like twenty different. <laughs> very added arguments. Yeah. That's, just pretty, uh, that's, that's how it's pretty done. Common for like. Signature. Yeah, yeah, the pile yeah. got too big Scala. after twenty, so they just Scala has that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. Haskell. Yeah. Anybody? I keep saying it's like sixteen. Usually, ends up bottoming out. Nice. It's, it's a performance <laughs> issue, right? In closure, I think. Oh really? I don't think so. Wait, <laughs> said it was a person. Twenty <laughs> arguments. I think you're thinking about chunking in thirty-two. Maybe I don't no, know. No, I'm thinking about you. You can have twenty-one arguments, right? They solve that as well. It says up to 20 that it's hard coded. Oh, I think. Okay. could be. I don't know. I just looked at the actual code and I'm like, I guess 20 is the limit. <laughs> anyway, um, I think it's a fine limit. I, I have a <laughs> syntax question for YAML script, and I'm kind of confused between data mode and code mode. I mean, okay. Uh, can you go back to the slide with yeah. um, the double? Colons and that was that data mode with the double colons. I think that um, I think it's a feather, like it's a toggle. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, we're getting ahead of it. It's the one with the modes in it. I'm looking for modes. Here we go. Uh, one of the examples. Okay. Yeah. So 
age double colon is that's a I can do that in data mode and then I and then I'm writing closure. Right. So that, after the double quotes. That's right. But only for that node. If that node was a, a mapping, then the whole mapping would be, but you know, it's for the for the entire node, but that entire node just happens to be this scalar. So that's going to be parsed using that regex into tokens. That's going to be parsed into a tokenized and then parsed and eventually becomes a, an AST. We'll see Is exactly how this multi-line. Can I do multi-line? Can I write multi-line program into a multi-line? Yeah, of course. With the into that after that double quote. Yeah, sure. The question was, can you do multi-line closure at any level? And yeah, you just type a pipe and do like a, a literal thing and do as much. So I do a double colon and then pipe new line right. tab, and then I can go to the races with closure. Now I'm just right. writing like a bunch of closure. So the interesting thing was this started in data mode. So this is just the word name, but this started in code mode. So this is actually the symbol or variable hobbies that I'm assigning this list to because then I switched to data mode to get that list because I couldn't even use the dashes in code mode because that's not allowed. And there's one return value. Yes. And, yeah, and it's, it's always assigned to the symbol on the left. It's the age, like this, whatever the symbol was that started this that gets the return value, the single return value from right. This whole thing, code, this whole thing whatever is whatever the output was. The this whole thing's a mapping. And so, yeah, and it actually goes through and evaluates all these in sequence. And then the last value is returned, just like it's just the close. It's, it's, is everything in closure and expression? Yes. Yeah. No statements. Okay. That's right. The question was, is everything in closure an expression? An expression? And I guess you, you whispered it because you realized everybody here was a closure. Not, <laughs> not, not us on. Yeah, not, <laughs> not some of it. I don't know closure. So that's right. What I'm, yeah, what I'm asking. My three my, friends don't know closure. At after the double Olens is not familiar to me. So that's why I'm asking what I should do there. Right. And like I said before, this is just a plain scalar that happens to end up with a colon. Like, you know, it could be, this would be fine too. Hmm. Confuses um, the syntax highlighter though. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, I don't, the syntax highlighter has no, no idea about YAML script, whether YAML, yeah. YAML. Okay. Now we got to find out where we were. We passed that, we did that. Um, yeah, so we already spotted the Scotch. Can everybody see what the problem with this code is? It's the uh, 42 after string end. Right. And so, yeah, so we do that, and it, it actually points out, yeah, you can't have a 42 you, after you, you have a dot in there. Yeah, I think you, a dot would be nice. Oh, there we go. Put a dot right there. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of the back tick in Ruby, but I think the back tick is balanced in okay. Ruby. Let's see. Okay, so flow syntax for this in JavaScript, but I can't remember what it is. We're back on to your uh, to your thing about. Um, Double colons and and modes. Okay. So we have this flow collection. What's going to happen? We're um, okay. That's the other thing. I thought it would be really bad if you had to type in bang yaml script slash v one in a one liner. So if you use minus e, you always start in data mode. I'm oh, sorry, code mode. Unless you use the minus m flag, and then you can say minus m d for data mode or minus m. B for bare mode. So you could, there's a minus M flag to set that. But by default, minus E always means that you start in code mode. So we're in code mode. What happens here? We enter it. Oh, we got an error. Block and flow, not allowed in code mode. I already said that. You can't use the JSONy stuff in code mode. But if we put a dot in front of it, then it's just a string. So it works. Now we just have this string that's, and then for the people who don't know, you don't Commas are just white space in closure and also in YAML script. Um, so you don't need commas in here. You could put commas in here and it would work fine. Um, so let's go to this. Here we're switching from, we're switching to data mode. And we do allow these square brackets without a dot in data mode. But what happens? We get a string of one, two, three, right? Yeah. Because unless you use commas in YAML, it just takes everything and makes it one string. Right, so if we do this, then it will give us back to what we wanted. Um, 
duplicate keys. I, this is the one where Tom's gonna have to bite his tongue because Tom and I argue. Tom's one of the YAML maintainers, and Tina is too. Um, uh, the, the core spec um, or the language maintainers. So we have the core team, the five of us. Um, so the spec says that duplicate keys are not allowed. And what it means, <laughs> Tom, <laughs> is that the data model does not support duplicate keys. So where does that fail? Well, actually, um, a lot of YAML loaders, they do different things. They'll either take the first one, the last one, sometimes they'll error, but it never fails at the parsing level because uh, YAML can handle infinite streams actually, and are very large things. You don't actually keep track of keys at that level. You're just break, basically breaking it into its elements and feeding it onto the thing that builds uh, the next level of tree or something like that. So duplicate key detection isn't handled there. And also in, so in YAML script, I'm not loading into a model where keys are even keys anymore, right? In the, in, the, in the data mode I am, and I have to do something with duplicate keys, it looks like, I think for this one, I actually just take the last one. I could throw an error. Um, I think it's actually nicer to take the last one and um, it's probably breaking the spec, but uh, people tend to do it this way. Um, so let's see what happens. And then over here, I, I have say a bunch of times. Well, if I was loading this into a data structure, that wouldn't work, but this is making an AST that I'm gonna render into code, so it's it's fine. Um, okay, so let's run these things. So here we're gonna load the keys as data, and it just took the second one, right? We had one, two, three, and four, five, six as foo. There's duplicate keys, it just took the second one. Here, we're gonna say everything, thing, but um, I forget what that code even said. What did it do? Okay, right. So we did say, and then we switched to data mode and we had to throw away one of these. So we, we kept the four, five, six, but we we said all three things um, with, with say. So run that one more time. So we say three things, but we only keep one of those keys. Okay. So that's all I got to say about duplicate keys. Um, uh, Andrew put in the chat that that's undefined behavior in C apparently. No, in the style of C, you know, it's it, you you haven't defined what the behavior should be, so you need to put in the documentation that you risk nose demons. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, so let's rock. Um, by that I mean, let the uh, the, uh, the list thing. Uh, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's do rock in YAML script, and uh, I hope you'll agree with me on this one. This this is one of my favorite things about YAML script. So, all right. This is like a, a special form. Um, I mean, so like in, in closure, there's of the functions, uh, like 10 to 15 of them are special forms. They're built into the compiler, like if and do and stuff like they're not actual functions, they're not macros, they're handled specially. Um, this is kind of like that. The equals actually gets turned into either a def or a let, depending on whether it's at the top level or not. Um, so you can see on the, on the right, this got turned into a def, um, but within this function body, these got turned into lets. And it did it really nicely because every time you do a let, I mean, luckily Rich made it so that you could define multiple um, let bindings at once. You didn't have to go down a level of indentation for every single one. Although if let and one let, you do, they only do singles. I actually have a macro in my, two macros in my code, if lets and when lets, and I use them all the time <laughs> and they're awesome. Um, is that chained together? So like it'll only work multiple. if they all? Yeah, they yeah. have to all, right. Nice. It, 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 it makes the code really nice. Um, so I went down all these levels and this is just, it's just clean and straight, which I think is really nice. So I, I bound these two together and then I'm like, okay, I got to do something, say, and I'm like, oh, I have another let. So then we went down another level and we did this. There is one problem with this though, that I just, happened to run into yesterday. Check this out. So if we do this, what happens? We say we're basically doing a let binding, but then we don't have any code under it, right? So um, we're assigning one and then we have this thing, but this is really its own self-contained thing. It's like it doesn't even belong there. And then we say, and it's actually going to say one. So as it should. As it should. And so I talked to, okay, I have a, um, what would I call him? A guru, a mentor. He's like, he's my guy. And he's been, he used to contribute to CoffeeScript 12 years ago. 
he re does he worked on Perl six, which on Perl part of the Perl community. He's like, I just knew him. His name is Ven, and he's just a really active hacker. I think he's like 28, 29 years old. He's just like, and he's been doing this for like since he was probably well, easily as a teenager. He lives in Paris. Never met him. Um, I hope to maybe meet him this year. But he's he just filed a ticket on some project I was doing, and I'm like, whoa, you're Ven. You're Ven Dathil. Um we got to talk, drop by my, my, uh, my channel. And we've been talking every day since, and I run every day thing by him. And I learned very quickly when he disagreed, it might take me a day or two to realize, but he's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, I asked Ben about this. I'm like, what are we going to do here? And he's like, well, just, you know, just warn that, I mean, just don't allow it. Don't try to do anything fancy. And I think that's the right move for now. Um, like let's compile this thing and see what that looks like. So if we compile that, yeah, we can see we have an expression in the middle, but nothing happens outside the expression, right? Here, we did a binding, but we have more in the expression. We're going to say that thing. But here, we just had, so this is, so just warn, you did a let with nothing in it, um, a useless let. Okay, so let's rock. Um, this is great. List has S expressions. YAML script has yes expressions. Or better <laughs> anyway so um yeah it's it's pretty simple you've seen a bunch of this already and i'll explain the whole of it um if you have a symbol right up next to a open paren then you swap it around um so you get these for all of these operators if you have a triple only um in parens it will swap the first and second so that the operator comes first but for plus and times I decided to make those polymorphic and do underscore plus, which is you can add strings, you can add numbers, you can add um, mappings, you can add uh, vectors together. Um, uh, but division is just numbers. Uh, now, this is an error. Oh, I, I didn't explain. If you have multiple ones, I don't do any precedence because I shouldn't. But if you have multiple ones, I collapse them into this. And this turned out to work. I realized that the dot, it wasn't always this way, but I'm like, the dot is just a regular operator. It's like, it's as if you wrote it like this. And look, I have an expression where they're all the same thing. So then I can actually just put the dot in front. I actually, instead of dot, dot is actually a thing in closer, so I use underscore, underscore. Um, and that's um, basically the threading operator. It does all that smart threading stuff um, with these forms. Why well, so, did you change the, from a prefix to infix? Why did I change? Yeah, why did you swap the like the parentheses function name goes outside? What motivated that? I'm just curious. I think that the question was why did I do any of this? I think yeah. basically yeah, yeah. because this is what people who are don't code Lisp see every day in almost any language, right? Yeah. This is Ruby. This is Python. This yeah. is Node, right? Um, this is Ruby, Python, Node, Perl, whatever. It's just like sure. yeah. So it's, I just wanted to make but. You don't have to do it this way. You can do it the closure way in this. It doesn't, it's, you don't have to do it this way. It's just one way of doing it. And it's the, I would call it the preferred way. I mean, it's the way I'm going to like show code when I write the book and all that kind of stuff, but you know. So, but there is a case. What if you actually had to say, I have a function A and I want to pass it the, the function B and the symbol, or the function plus and the symbol B. Um, and this is one way you can do it. Since it's not a triple in here, I don't change anything. But then since the A is out here, I just actually flip it. So if we go and actually compile this code, it just stays A plus B, which is what you wanted, you crazy list programmer. Yeah, because like if you call like apply and you give it exactly three arguments, or I guess like two, right? It'd be like apply open parentheses like plus and then you know, X and Y. Good point. Good point. Yeah, no, that's yeah. Sure, or reduce. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. What happens? I guess. Well, you would just say reduce open paren plus, and then the right. I would. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of a real common use case, but thank you. That's good. Um, I I found this page that looks like it was written in the '90s, but I think it was written in a. You know, it's a, what do they call it? GeoCities. 
yeah. Angel Fire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, this, this, this guy just wrote this like thing about all of this stuff. And I, I used all of his suggestions. He he uses curly braces and all all these non-closery things to for different stuff, but um I took as much of this as I could. Um he was the one that says, yeah, if you have A plus B plus C, make it plus A B C. And then it turned out to be a real win in the end, I think. So anyway, he actually wrote it in 2006, not in the 90s. He should have known there was CSS by then. <laughs> um, okay. And where's your max width margin auto? What time are we at, Patrick? Uh, we are at 7.27. Okay. Well, I'm going to keep going. Um, okay, so there's these... Uh, Dynamic variables, um, Closer has them. It's like where you put your command line arguments and various things. There's some handy arguments, but I made them a lot shorter, no earmuffs, just all caps. Um, so argv is your arguments coming in from the command line. Ignore this thing right here. I wanted to put dash dash, but it, I have a bug in my code, so I just put an empty file. Um, anyway, ignore that. Just pretend like it's a dash dash. So um, yeah, these come in as strings. But then I'm like, you know, most of the time I want these to come in as what they look like. So args with an S at the end comes in as parsed stuff. So if it's a string, it's, it looks like a string, a string. It looks like a number, it's a number, et cetera. Um, this is your current working directory. Uh, this is your current environment. I guess this will be on video. Hopefully there's nothing private in there. I already checked, actually. <laughs> um, this is okay. So now we did. We, this is the current file name, but since we did minus e, I just call it no name. But I still put it under the um, the current path because they all the file always returns the full path. So I just did it that way. Um, yeah. Oh, ink is your include path, and so it's this is if you write um, an external YAML script library and you want to in, include it as a library, you have to look it up from somewhere. You either look it up in the current directory. Or you can use this variable ys path. So if I specify this, but I didn't put the current directory, well, it's going to blow up. The, oh, wait, you're supposed to blow up. No, you're just supposed to. No, that was fine. Later it blows up. There's another slide where it blows up. Here I just wanted to print the path. That that works fine. Okay, here's the current version, and these are the versions of Psi and Closure as well in our mapping. Um, and yeah, there's a few more slides, but it'll go pretty fast. So, okay, here's some interesting operators. We have the dot, which I already know. So I, I can do string plus string. I can do uh, vector plus vector. I can go um, three times string and get three, three, three. I can do it on either, either uh, direction. Um, here's some interesting chaining. So I get one. And then I increment it, make it two, turn it into the string two, and then four of those two. So it's two, 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 two as a string, or two, 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 two. Um, here's 10 down to one um, without the extra enclosure. In, in if you say uh, one to 10, you really get one to nine in the, in the range operator, but this just does. Um, and that, actually, I brought it up, and Alex Miller explained why it was better. But oh, here's the. Um, the negative number with the, so this is a RAM and this is a mod. So we'll see what happens here. Um, I still couldn't even tell you, but let's see what <laughs> it does. Um, here's a regex application and let's just run this. Oh, you can see how they translate over there with the RAM and the mod. So we'll run it. Yeah, so one produce, I guess, RAM produced negative two and mod produced five. I don't. You can explain it to me later. Eric thinks he knows. He makes total sense to him. It's another round of finite field. Okay. One of them is wrong. Oh, and this was <laughs> this was <laughs> this was the regex application where I had a capture. So I captured the OO, and um, we can see it gave me the, the full match on the capture. Okay. Um, Are you going to tell us what happens if you don't have that return nil at the end? Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Andrew's got your answer. Mod applies over the finite. Oh, Andrew Pam, you have a question. Or, uh, he's at his hand raised for a while. Uh, he yeah. posted in the chat, uh, mod applies over the okay. field of positive integers. 
I, it's always absolute, right? Oh, I sorry, I, I didn't realize my uh, my hand didn't go down from the first question. Though. Let me lower my hand manually. Okay, thank you. I I don't. I'll get confused if I try to understand it. So just explain it to me later. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, oh yeah, literal scalars. So these are like here documents, and so. Um, this is a really cool thing that I invented this morning for this talk. It's, it's just going to rock. But I, I wanted to show um, closure doesn't have here docs, and it really most languages don't. Like triple brackets or triple quotes in Python, they're not the same thing. They're like um, here documents mean you could take any text and not have to quote anything in it and use that value. So you can take whole programs, and in YAML it's even great because you don't even have to pick an end. Indicator, you just invent it. You're talking about triple tick, triple, yes, triple double quotes, yeah, triple, triple doubles, double, Impact triple Impact. single. Oh, sorry, I think they're both not a Python developer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, sorry, no, that's all right. They're, they're not. I was gonna say, do they come from like shell, like born shell? Shell, yes. Okay. Pearl took them from shell. So, but the triple quotes in Python are not the same thing. They're no. like distinct like strings. Okay, they look similar, superficially. They, you use them for kind of the same purposes, okay, but it. It, they don't have the same semantics. But, but um, the Born Shell one is the one you're specifically thinking about. For I'm this. thinking of the Pearl one, which is taken from the Born Shell, but that's where I first saw them. But I also do a lot of batch programming, so... Um, Sorry, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it? Burn. I can show you how Burn great it is. Burn Shell. Burn yeah. Shell. <laughs> All right, so check this out. Um, let's have some fun with literal scalars. And <clears throat> okay, so I decided I was going to make a YAR file, which is like a tar file in YAML script. So I have two files. And notice this is a double document or two document stream. So the first document is my is my tar of two files. I took a make file, and here's an interesting thing. That, that's a tab. Tabs aren't allowed as indentation. Well, that's not indentation. Tabs are allowed in YAML files as content. It's fine. It just can't be as indentation. Um, so I have a make file, and I have a YAML script file. They're just like they're going to be this, except unindented. Is okay. the syntax highlighting of like build, you know, percentage dot CLJ colon? Those are like right. Yeah, they're, they're... I, it's yeah. Go it's anybody's you. guess. Um, Who's going to write? The um, new syntax highlighter. For there you the go. Next Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of better. <laughs> I had a, I had a project where I was going to write. You can write um, syntax spec and have it work in a hundred editors. That was quite, you know, and not based on Creaseter. I didn't really do it. I just thought of it. Sure. <laughs> so, bots. Classic Angular. Uh, yeah. So. Okay, now here we have some closer YAML script code. I'm going to take each of those files, name and text, loop over them, and I'm going to spit them out. Um, just print the text of the file. Great. And then I'm going to run some shell commands with my sh uh, secret thing. I'm going to. This makes me sweat. <laughs> Crazy, <laughs> huh? So I'm going to untar this thing. I'm going to run make on it. We need eval in every language, right? Right. This makes me nervous. And is, it's going to convert. Is spit a built-in? Yes. Okay. Spit is a closure core built-in. Yeah. What does the dollar sign mean on the each line? That's the best question I've had on it. I forgot to say that. Dollar sign is the evaluation value of the previous document. So see how we have two documents. That sounds bashy. You, you'll see this in a second, but I have dollar dollar is all of the evaluation of all of them. It's a mapping. Uh where colon one points to the first one, colon two points to the second one, et cetera. So it's like star one in the, the closure REPL. Yeah. Yep. And then, um, but yeah, so I want to refer into this document. And in, in YAML, you can have anchors and aliases. They can't span documents. So if you define something up here, you can't use it down here. That's not allowed. Um, but this is YAML script, so do anything I want. Um, so dollar is the previous value, and I'm going to, yeah, dollar system mapping, it's this mapping above. Wait, but there's, so there's two top level like keys or whatever, two top level things in the previous document. Hello, yeah. make file and hello.yes. There's two names and two values, right? Right. So are you looping through, like, is there two steps in the loop? One of them is make file, one of them is hello.yes, yes, or? 
No, this is, dollar sign. this is the, I'm destructuring this mapping. You use this is just a do seek. Yeah, yeah. With a destructure of the key value pairs, right? Uh, so oh, because the two different file names. Okay, I get it. Okay. The key is the file name, and the the value is the file content. Yeah, and then I just uh, okay. you're iterating through each top level thing. Yeah, okay. this is just a mapping. Yeah, right, right. Okay. And uh, Tina chimed in: self advertisement, Python YAML to YAML PP hyphen highlight to get ANSI colored YAML. This should be available on most Linux distros. Oh, nice. Thanks, Tina. Pretty print. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so <laughs> yeah, and then this basically there's a problem. The plus 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 gets generated, and I think somebody asked what that was. Uh, I was asking, yeah, well, about the the last line nil return but right so plus 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 so what happens is i wrap each document in a plus 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 and that's what saves it into a place where i can access it with dollar sign later so that's how i create these things is by wrapping the last um, expression in each document with a plus 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 on that and that's internal for yaml script well it's not going to work when i pipe it in the closer so i just replace it with identity here um, and i had a escaping quest problem so i I had to use dot, 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 dot to match the first four characters and replace that with identity because they're one of my, I had a little backslashing bug that I didn't feel like uh, I didn't have time to deal with. And then I'm going to pass, and then I'm going to have a closure file that I'll run as closure. So let's try it. And this is going to happen quick. I'm telling you. Here we go. I'm going to CD into dir where this thing is. Um, and I am going to run this YAML script thing that's going to untar itself and do all that stuff. And that only slowdown was the JVM startup time to run that closure. <laughs> so it, in fact, I ran it as uh, BB and it's just like, boom, instant. So um, yeah, and so let's go and look what ended up in the dir after we untarred it. We had, there was the files that we wanted and then we ran make on it. So we got um, the closure file. But, so we got, oh shoot, sorry. These two files, the make file and the YS file, were in the jar or the the YAR file, <laughs> and then uh, and then we compiled it and got the CLJ file and we ran it and we printed hello, and then um, we can run make clean on it. I put a clean thing in there, so this will actually uh, I'm going to make clean and cleaned up that directory and then I'm going to try making clean again, but there's no make file. It doesn't even work. See, no make file. Wow. Ah. Okay. I like that one. And like, I just thought of it last night and I'm like, I'm going to get up early and make that work. And it worked. It was beautiful. It like, I, I was surprised. I thought it was going to take a lot more time than it did. Um, okay. So there's three ways you can do interpolation. We kind of talked about this. You can do single word. You can do dollar print and put any expression in between the parens, or you can just do um, one, a one expression where you do that it's basically you do the flip. It's the, the yes expression. It's take this symbol and then switch it into this. So this is actually paren randomth gain. Um, and those are the three styles that you can do. And that's, you can see the code that it generates, but let's do it real quick. We'll run it. And, uh, what changes here? Oh yeah, just our game changes. Archery, darts, a lot of darts, not chess. Okay. Um, Okay, I think we've seen most of dot threading. Let's see if there's anything new here. Not really, except for curl is a built-in. So I just put a YAML file up, a sample YAML file called some YAML, and uh, curl is just a, a built-in standard function. So that it, that pulled down some text. And I also have YAML loader as one of the uh, pre-built-in modules. So I can just say YAML load, and I, I'm basically calling YAML load on the text I just downloaded by using the dot chaining. And then, of course, load always spits stuff back in JSON. So I was going to, well, actually, I told it to with the minus J here. Um, this time, instead of taking all of it, we'll take the members thing. Um, we'll take the second or the third member and take their superpowers, immortality, heat immunity, boring. Um, and yeah, shuffle. Remember, the, the underscore says this is uh, thread last instead of thread first. Um, yeah, so, et cetera. Okay. <laughs> Andrew has a question. Andrew, Pam. Yeah, I put it in the chat. I said, um, is this an awesome new attack vector where uh, um, black hats can try and trick people into evaluating YAML script from web from URLs? <laughs> I think so. 
Not really new. I mean, we've always been able to. Read. Oh no! You should never evaluate anything from the web side unseen. But there's there's probably going to be some poor sucker somewhere who haven't haven't yet realized that YAML can now be a full Turing complete language. Good well, yeah, the Babaska program uses the same thing, and they have. I know it has. He has safe environments. I can't believe anything's safe these days. But um, I think it should be valid for like when you use this in Python to say these are the capabilities I want to give this engine to do. So it shouldn't just be full power all the time. Um, and also more generally, like, uh, like this is presumably not going to be the default behavior of all like YAML implementations to just sight unseen, run it as though it were YAML script. That, that seems like something you would have to deliberately invoke. And then deliberately invoking that on something that you have just curled would be like exactly the same kind of error as doing that with any other interpreter. Yeah. Right. So you're running the yes command. We're calling it that now, right? <laughs> YS. I call it wise. Wise. <laughs> All right. This um, debate will go on forever. The wise command. <laughs> but, um... Right. But if it becomes a standard library that's used in various languages, you'll want to, again, be careful that it's documented that uh, you that you are actually executing a Turing complete interpreter there and not just not just uh, parsing. That's important for people to know that. I mean, we all know that people pipe stuff into Bash all the time, but we still shouldn't be handing out more foot guns. Yeah, I, I, when I, like earlier talking about using YAML script as my loader to have consistent error everywhere, hmm. uh, like maybe I would want to flag that to add, you know, an attribute or I mean, param on my library that says just load, let me parse don't execute. Well, you right? use the data mode, right? But wouldn't data mode, if my file was in data mode, because that's like the, the right. decoration at the top the of the file, file determines that. the file would determine that. And then the my my right. loader would execute. And I don't think people can still toggle, remember? They can toggle inside the file. So you have to have a way of yeah. disabling. So yeah. when I load. That's exactly what I was saying. I want to be able to basically use your loader for consistency, but disable some evaluation. Yeah, if you're doing untrusted stuff, of course you would want to do that. Yeah, you would want to say, um, don't just throw an error on code mode. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, who's here has heard of Rosetta code? I know Andrew has because I yep. talked to talk. Yeah. So um, it now has a uh, YAML script stuff. I wonder who put it up there. Okay, so I have um, there's seven programs, and you've seen 99 bottles already. Some other ones. Um, not too much to say about this, except um, one thing I will say is that this is a project I wrote maybe 15 years ago. Um, I scraped all of this. It's a media wiki site, and it has, I think, about 115,000 programs in. Oh, 900 and some languages. Oh, it says right up there, 900 languages, all these tasks. But it's about 115,000 individual programs. I scraped them all into one site. And I actually did this last night, so it would be fresh um, for the talk. So, but yeah, if you, so here's the YAML script directory. But if you go back up, here's all of the, the language directories. Oh, and uh, Andrew had one more uh, question or question slash comment. I think you said bear mode is never code mode. Maybe there could be a way to enforce bear mode. So I get the load function, but no execution. Right. If I yeah. load in bear mode. Yeah, that's what we just said. So yeah, you would have to say um, only use bear mode for the, for my loading and throw an error otherwise. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So we talked about this uh, V0 fruits are proof. So we'll skip this slide. Um, oh, I, I will show you this code so you can see how I install stuff. So I just installed YS and YS0 point to 41. Um, and I, I used to point to these other versions as I was installing them. Um, but anyway, in the hash bang, you have to use YS0. And that will never point to a YS1 point something. So, yeah. OK, this is kind of a weird. I don't know, question. Is YAML script a Lisp? I, I was like, like Tom would say, hell no. 
Um, <laughs> let's see, I'm not sure. And I've read a bunch of stuff. So um, it's a gateway to a Lisp. Um, and you can't get good at YAML script without learning Lisp. But what defines a Lisp is uh, YAML script is really closure. Closure is a Lisp. I mean, I think everybody would agree that it's a Lisp. YAML script must be a Lisp, but not maybe not. Um, but is closure really a Lisp? Because it has no consoles. You know, I mean, there's going to be people that say closure is not a Lisp. It has no consoles. And it's cons thing isn't even cons. I mean, it's like it's a lie. I read somewhere some, where somebody said they were actually a closure fan, but they said cons is a lie. <laughs> so, <laughs> and is it homo iconic? I was reading about this. You know, it's like what is closure homo iconic? I mean, basically, as I, as I did this implementation of make a Lisp, um, they explained homo iconicity, and it was basically whatever you read and then a val you you printed. It was then again code that you could read, eval, and print again. So, sure. but in closure, you, you don't get the same thing out. Like you actually compile to Java functions and you get different things back. And in YAML script, it's a lot wilder. You get like what you, you get in closure code out from your input being YAML, but there could be a printer that printed it back to, I don't know. But that's more like a heuristic, right? Like and the closure code is, you know, written in the closure data structure, right? By virtue right. of that, it's so like iconic. I don't. But at the REPL, you don't always get in. You type an ex expression, and you don't get back exactly what you typed in. I mean, semantically you do, mm -hmm. but it's changed forms a little bit. So, well, it's still like in, for example, like a list, right? It still comes back in the form of like right a just a node like it's clearly a data structure that also holds code. Yeah, I'm not saying YAML yeah. script. Well. I will say it's a list, but I won't like. Sure, yeah. I won't yeah. bet my kids on it. I don't have kids, yeah, but Andrew YAML just, script is my kids. Andrew just said uh, it has parens. It must be a list. <laughs> Python must be a list. Then. Yeah. Come on. Sure. Anyway. Replace the colons with more parens. Uh, bash. Bash has. Uh, what did I do? Someone should make a Lisp alignment chart. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So this is really interesting part. This is where I talked at the beginning about the YAML load stack. And this is the YAML, the YAML script compiler is just a fancy YAML loader. It has a couple more layers in it than a normal loader, but it has all the same things as a normal loader. So let's um, let's look at the code real quick of, a comp of the YAML script compiler. It's really simple. And you can see it has, it pulls in the libraries for each stage, parse, compose, resolve. We saw those. Then I add build and transform those aren't normal, and then construct, that's normal, and then print is just, that's just a list thing. That's what you do once you have your um, AST, you print it again to code. So it's just a printer. I mean, this is a standard list. So a transformer is really my macro system where I can take, you can define ways to transform the AST. And the builder is that thing that actually takes the, you know, it's where the regex thing happens. It's, it takes a a scaler and it turns it, it like lexes it out lexing. and turns it into an AST. Yeah, for each part of the YAML thing. So really up until the transformer, everything is still, I don't merge the key and the values of the mapping pairs until construction. And that's when I make a final AST that represents a Lisp. But everything kind of maintains that YAML balance up through transformation. And here's the code that actually calls it. And it's just a threaded thing. It used to it was way simpler until I added the multi-doc. I have to parse this all at, one, at once at the beginning. So I parse this and then I loop through and I pull it out by where the docs end and start new doc starts. But then I pass each of those groups through the rest of the stages. It used to just be parse and then the rest was just one of the stages and it was just this. So that's the whole compiler right there. I mean, well, there's some code in each of these things that do some things, but it's not really that complicated. In fact, the parser, which I stole from um, Snake YAML's Java parser, which is written in, in Java, um, so it's easy to plug in, and it did all the right things. Um, so going back to here, there's a D flag on the YS command that will print out the contents of all the states. So I'm going to take this YAML script. I'm going to say 
Um, I'm going to take two sequences and add them together to make basically conch them together into one big sequence. And so what's going to happen here is I parse it with snake ammo. And these are the events. Um, so, and I, there's a few extra events, but I, these are the important ones. I, yeah, I have a mapping and two values. It's the left-hand side and the right-hand side of that one pair. So map is just a um, plus map starts the mapping and then minus map ends the mapping. And so it's just a, one pair of two, a key and a value. Then I compose that into a tree. And then the resolve step is where I assign a tag. And here I just use keywords. So I say it's almost like internally you're saying bang exp and bang um, exp here. So it's two expressions. And then build is where I said that I go through and actually parse these things with the, the Lexer parser into symbols, integers, and that kind of thing. I take um, and lists. You can see how that all got tra transformed. Doesn't do anything usually. You can see it's exactly the same here. And then construct, I make a final um, AST that prints to closer code um, and then wraps a plus 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 around it. Um, and then I print it. And that's, that's exactly what it. So that's how my compiler works. Okay. And so actually, Patrick wanted to learn about compiler theory for me tonight. But <laughs> there you go. That's I, That's all I got. Awesome. Very cool. Um, I'm taking away from this is use regex. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just know. Think about what you're doing and use common sense. Um, That's a stack choice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Andrew suggested that in the uh, hypothetical list alignment chart, the YAML script would be chaotic good. Chaotic good? <laughs> yep. <laughs> um. Okay, so yeah, I have these binding modules for Perl, Python, Raku, which is Perl 6, just because somebody offered to do it. All of these I got other people to do, except for the Python one. I just, I wrote, I'm not even a Python guy. I just decided that would be a good one to have as a reference. And um, somebody- closure isn't one of the first ones. Yeah. No, in fact, um, do you know Delon Newman? He's on the closure, he's just the guy that's on the, on the closure Slack. He came by. And says I'll do Ruby, and then he said, "No, like, I'll do Closure in Java." He wants to do Go next. He's like really into it. So, but he's buying a house this one, so he just did this in his spare time. Anyway, <laughs> I really wanted to get these done for tonight, but uh, they're not merged yet. <laughs> so it's interesting because all of these reach out and just do an FFI binding to this lib YAML script, and the Java one does that, even though it's in Java. I could just use it directly, but I want to do it the same in Java as I do in the other languages. But then for closure, he just actually used the Java thing as a dependency. And I think that's fair mm -hmm. because closure is really just Java yeah. with a, a, no, a different build system around it and a way better language around it. <laughs> yep. So, um, yeah, and that's all, everything I just said. And there's only one method, it's called load. You give it YAML script and you get back JSON. And if you try to load YAML that doesn't load into JSON, it doesn't work. So when I said every file was, there's all kinds of YAML that's not valid YAML script, but nobody uses that. Anybody that does configs is really just trying to get a JSON right. model blob back. Um, yeah, so let's take a quick look at this. This is, this is the Python code. It's not really that interesting, but let's look at the use case. It's like a 150 line Python module. Um, Before you move on, uh, what is an FFI binding? Oh, sorry, a foreign function interface. It's a way to, um, a shared library is like a SO file or a DLL or a DLive on Mac. And it's just a, a compiled blob that you can get dynamically linked. And so FFI is one of the new ways to do from almost any language has an FFI facility for making function C level function calls against a uh, how do you get structs mapped between one to the other and function call invocation mapped from one to the right. other? Gotcha. Like okay. if you have a C, yeah, if you have a C signature, how am I going to call this from this language, and how are things going to map? Yeah, right. so everything right. speaks the C ABI. Yeah. So um, let's look at how we test that part. So yeah, um, this is how you would use this in any language. You'd load the module. You'd get some YAML scripts. Um, you'd create a 
yellow scripts ob object and then you call the load method on it, it returns some JSON and then you can do whatever you want with it. So um, in this case, let's run it and there we go. Um, yeah. So it's just not much there, but that's the way you're going to use this in every language. So. Cool. Um, can I build a node one first? Oh, I don't know how to do that. Huh? That'd be a fun thing to Google. Yeah. Sure. Do you want to do a PR for another one? I'm not committing to anything, but it sounds like a fun attempt. Yeah, sure. same. Cool. I already yeah. put placeholders in for the module, so like, I would encourage you to make a a PR to the project, and then, uh, like, I want them all to like not come from. I want like be a part of the project, not like don't do it on your own. Join yeah. the, the our community and. We'll publish your code. And, I mean, you can you can you can actually push it. I don't care if that. That's like, <laughs> you know, cool. you don't want it to come from someone else's repo. You want it. To that's be, it is all yeah. part of the yeah. If there is a mono repo for all of this, in fact, like yeah. the, the website, even this talk is part of the mono repo. But um, but yeah, I want to keep it all. So like every new thing that we add, we add to all forty two languages at once. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. Okay. So this is. The other thing that I wrote this morning, and this is kick ass. This is going to blow you guys away. I mean, if we, if we stop after this slide, um, I can go home happy. Um, okay, so I'm already blow away. <laughs> <laughs> so when you generate code, there's there's a good side and a bad side. The bad side is you have another layer of abstraction. So when errors happen, you have to like. And then you have to do things like source mapping so that you actually point to the right places and all that stuff. And I'll do all that eventually. I mean, even right now, you're getting back Java errors uh -huh. for something where there's no JVM. It just feels insane, right? Or the bash <laughs> errors or closure errors. It's like, what? So just don't get any errors in YAML script and you'll be fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the great side about um, code generating is you can do all kinds of fancy stuff with a, a cleaner input, right? Um, yeah, so let, let, let's see what I've done. Um, so in Bash, there's this set minus X. I don't know if you've ever used it in your non-Bash programming that you do, never. Um, so if you do this in a program, it will print every function before it calls it. Um, and it's really, it's like so easy to debug a Bash script. You just put set minus X and you're like, oh yeah, you just read through and oh yeah, now I see why it failed. Huh. It actually printed everything. Nice. Um, so yeah, let's just run this this try thing that we ran before, but this time we set minus x in there. Okay, so we went down here. Let's see, keeps going, does all that. Does that? Yeah. Okay, that's it. Um, what if we could do that in closure? That would be pretty cool. Well, if we're generating code, we sure as hell can. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, everything. Yeah, you just, all right, so let's do it. Um, so here's our old, old favorite program, right? Um, but I, I did it one bottle of beer, or one bottle of list, sorry. <laughs> so let's trace it. Boom. Okay, so what happened here? Nice. Plus, 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 called main. Um, main didn't apply. Oh, sorry. Called, yeah. Anyway, you can see what it does. It's doing all the things. And I just got this working this morning, and it's just a macro called um, underscore T. And I could probably make it a little better. I could probably even put the return value, um, which would be just fantastic. Um, yeah, and it, you get the same thing at the end. I didn't really even think it was going to work. Like, I'm like, something's going to bite me in the... It's like, something won't work. But it, it seems to work great. Um, so let's compile it and see what it looks like. Yeah, so you just see in front of every uh, expression evaluation, I put this underscore T macro. Um, that's just... Takes the arguments, takes, prints them out. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yep. It's a bit uh, like the hash p uh, reader time, right? That's what that's it. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, in fact, I named it the same thing. So in yeah. Bash, you can use x trace as the long form or x as the short form, and the same with the uh, with YAML scripts. Yeah. Straight from Bash, baby. Oh uh, yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so we talked a little bit about the macro system. I haven't figured out the best way to do this to the user, but sometimes you want to 
organize the AST a little bit differently than the normal way. I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, sorry, macros and YAML. Well, okay, so look at look at this code, right? So we have require, and I'm like, this is how I want to do requires. Here's some modules. Here's my um, my imports or exports or refers, you know, and this is um, as stuff. Well, I didn't use the as symbol at all. So what's happening here? I had to like, I had an AST, but I had to go through this AST and go, yeah, if you see a arrow here, just make that an as. And otherwise you see some stuff um, at the end of this expression for require, it's only for require, right? So I walk the require result and then I go, okay, I wanna handle this one specially. I wanna do this one differently. This is the code I wanna generate, which just, I mean, I know this looks normal to you in Clojure, but it looks terrible if you're seeing for the first time. <laughs> I mean, it's just, what? You know, it's just, come on up. <laughs> so, I mean, and maybe there's a better way to do this, but I thought this is, it's not bad. And actually, you know, like these, being on a separate line, it was just a style thing. It's like, um, because YAML scalars can go on separate lines. So it could easily just be like, oh, dang it. I'm not even sure. Use Calva. I do. I mean, yeah, this is Calva. Uh -huh. Calva is great. Thank you. Oh, Peter. Oh, there. Yes. On the bottom, you switch from being on the right side to the left side. So I thought you left, but just zoom, switching you around. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you a Calva thing real quick. Oh, yeah. uh, hey, uh, Ingi, we're in the uh, we're in the third hour of this uh, talk. I was just wondering how many more slides there are. Yeah, um, there are fourteen, but uh, we can go through them real quick. Let's see. Let me just see what I want. So, uh, we can skip this one. Yeah, who's speaking of? Oh, I just said speed run. Speed run. Yeah, let's do the speed run. I think Peter has a question. Though. Yeah, Peter, what's your question? Yeah, on require. Uh, do you support like re reload keywords? I, I only support what you saw right there right now. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. MVP. I mean, one day at a time. Man. <laughs> oh, this is this is a big deal. Um, I can actually take any script, including a one liner, and make a native binary out of it. This is cool. So, run this, and it prints "Hello World." Now I want to make a native binary executable. So I just do this and it says, this may take a few minutes. That's not a lot. Mm -hmm. This will take a few minutes. So I figured out a way to cheat. Let's just kill this. Um, Taking it out of the oven. We had a yeah. baked turkey. Yeah, I already baked this turkey. Yeah. So I'm just gonna copy <laughs> hi to hello here and then I'll run this baby. Oh yeah, it works. And it's fast. <laughs> Let's see how fast this baby is. I, four, all right, that's the fastest time I've, I've gotten four before, and that's the exact fastest time. Sometimes it goes like fifteen. It's, it's running. It's running really fast in the mothership. Yeah. yeah. While screen sharing too. Yeah. This is working on Windows. I almost got it working on Windows so soon. Yeah, I, I I've done some Windows stuff and I got it close, but then I had to give up. I just give up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but Bashka works on it. It's like it's just a matter of pain. Right. All of this is better. Okay, no. Andrew just asks, what's the size of the binary? That's a great question. And that's the next uh, part of the slide. Thanks, Andrew. 13 megabytes for oh. Hello World. Right. Actually, it's 13 meg. It's because it has the whole engine in there. Right, right, right. The growl right. bits. It's well, not, no, not the growl bits. The whole psi bits, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. The whole psi is in there. It doesn't have to be. I could get crazy and just prune it down, but that's work, you know, so. Yeah, it compares okay with a language like Go. You can always uh, count on someone to come along and do, like someone did a tiny Go, someone will do a, a tiny YAML script compiler one day. Yeah. Totally. Tiny yeah. side. Or somebody will pay me to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, yeah, so this is kind of like Babaska. It's got a bunch of built-in libraries. Um, in fact, Babaska is just the ultimate bl blueprint for this, and I didn't realize that till lately. Um, you, you know, Somebody might say, you're copying Babaskin. I'm like, no, I actually forgot to. But now that I know how I am, I'm going to copy everything about it because it's got all these great things. So um, here are the personal libraries that I'm shipping so far. Standard, YS is like um, where I replace. So use, I wanted that word for my own. 
So I put the closure one under CLJ use. If you want to use that, nobody, I mean, that's kind of deprecated anyway. Um, yeah, so a few things I really wanted the words um, for, for to be the first class citizens that do something different. Um, anyway, we're on a speed run. Um, yeah, so take a look at this. These are just... Uh, these are just some libraries that are closure libraries that already work with Babaska. That means, um, I'll just have to test it, but with a, a couple of days work, these all work with YAML script. Fantastic. And then he made this thing called pods and I don't fully understand it, but I have, I support it. So, <laughs> then, I, I think they can be written in any language. Um, but he has this whole um, pod registry, which are all these, yeah, I think you can write them in Python and all this kind of stuff like that. Um, and I'm going to show you really quickly. This is pretty cool. So here's a pod test. Um, I'm going to clean this up a little with macros. I don't like all the these ticks and stuff like that. But you say you use a pod, which actually will install it on your system if it's not already there. Um, it's kind of like a depth thing. And then uh, then you have to require the class out of it. And then you do some, yeah, so I'm doing some SQL crit. I'm using SQL8, and it doesn't do much, so it does this. Okay, but here's the cool thing. If I delete the cache, now watch, I run it again. So, yeah, it just grabbed all of its dependencies automatically, and I thought that was pretty damn cool. It's not, yeah. it's not what you want to do all the time, but, like, some of the time you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, great. Um, and there will be ways to... Um, you can actually put your depth CDN right in your YAML file because we support multi doc, right? So if you yeah, want to ship it that way, you can. Very cool. Like I was thinking, you could put a whole SQL database um, binary base64 encoded as a YAML document in your database as part of your YAML. Yeah. What could go wrong? Yeah. What could go wrong? Um, yeah. Okay. So this is how you write your own YAML script library. Okay. Here I have a YAML script app. And I'm going to use lib1, and I define lib1 over here. Um, lib1 has namespace lib1 and defines a foo. And it just prints foo however many times you want it to. I want to, in my main function, I want to print foo five times. So um, I'm going to run the app, prints foo five times in a numbered list. Now I'm going to give it a path. This is what I was trying to do before. And it's going to blow up. It can't find lib foo because it's in dot, and dot is the default path, but if you specify a path and don't put dot in it, you're not going to get dot. Um, yeah, and how much to say there? Okay. Yeah, so the whole thing's a mono repo, um, the CLI, the libyaml script, the compiler, all the binding modules, test suite, documentation, everything. Um, just... You bet. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. It's nice meeting you. Um, we're almost done here, but for the rest of you, very close. Um, yes. Yeah. Like I said, the build only needs git curl, bash, and make, and then it just downloads RHELVM that has, like, even if you have Java, somebody did it today, and it's like, it's downloading RHELVM. Is this going to mess up my system? I'm like, no, it's not going to use anything in your system. It's going to download line, which is like a, or lineagen, which is like a 50 line bash script. It's going to, download the growl thing, which has everything it needs. It's going to put them in temp and set a couple environment variables and do all of its stuff. And it works on every platform. I... What do you use growl for? So I use growl to convert to native binary. Okay, sure. So, nice. but what I also use growl for is everything because growl has the JVM and Java in the tarball. Mm -hmm. So you just identify your OS and your um, architecture and then you find the right binary, you download that, and then you point Java home at that directory, and then um, and then you put the Java home bin in your path, and that's all you need to do, and you have all of Java that you need, and you can just throw it away. So you could be on a, in a Docker container, whatever, that's all the setup you need to do. Cool. Uh, right. It's great. And I don't think people realize that. I was just... Yeah, Rawls, right? It's pretty... Well, just the fact that you could get all of Java, and so and then line goes and gets all of your closure dependencies, including closure itself. So mm. um, yeah, Linogen is, the combination yeah. is amazing. Um, okay. yeah, the, unit. So I do you, 
yeah, so I wrote my own test framework. This took a few weeks, but um, this is why here documents or YAML script literals are, so I'm taking this YAML script and I can just put it in here. And then I'm taking my parse tree and I can just put it in here. And um, this is pretty cool because this is where um, Halva comes in. You still awake, Peter? Can't believe you're still awake. It's like five in the morning, six in the morning. I, I actually have been um, sleeping, so I had a, uh, woke up early today. Oh, cool. All right, so here's um, here's the test suite, and let's uh, let's break a test. So we'll just change something. We'll put um, I don't know. We'll make this a xxx, and so all I have to do to run the test suite is hit. I have some key bindings. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so I got a failed test. I have 189, but one failed. What test failed? Well, I have a verbose mode. I hit another key binding that turns on verbose mode. You can see verbose is true now. And this will print out the name of every test. So now I can figure out which test failed, even though I know. Oh, it was in that file compiler stack, and it was test called... Um, most YAML syntax forms in one example. Um, oh, sorry. <coughs> I have to go back to the YAML file. Oh, it's this one. Oh, I see. Yeah, there's a, what's the diff here? Uh, it looks like an extra XX got in there somehow. Oh, yeah, there it is. I'll just remove that. And then I can go back and run the test suite again. So this is REPL testing that you're all familiar with. Um, and then I can turn off for post mode and there we go. And I can, instead of, I, this is the compiler, but this, um, these are all of the stages. If I just wanted to, if I can turn off all and just do the compiler stages. So this just ran the compiler test. Anyway, I took some time. I, it does build around Closure's test framework, but I really wanted to do the animal testing. I knew this is the way I wanted to specify my test because it was, this is just how the compiler testing all the stages was going to work really well, right? So, um, and after I started testing all these stages, they got pretty stable. And this is where I put most of my tests now. And it's just the, the input and the final output. And they're a lot simpler. Um, but yeah, these are all, so anytime I have a new input and output, that I need to find, just put a test in here. Works. Um, OK. Can YAML script be written in YAML script? Of course it can. Of course it can. Um, so I'll, I'll do that someday. Yeah, self-host it. Um, this was cool. So in December, I got a wave of insanity and decided I was going to write a blog post every day for every day of December up till uh, Christmas Eve. And so I did. And this was total insanity. I mean, these were a lot of work. And everyone, I was like, I haven't even implemented that. So I'd like work and I'm like, okay, I have to push this one back. It's not going to be implemented. And I was just like implementing stuff as fast as I could. And there's so much has been implemented. Some And sometimes I lie a little bit, but like, <laughs> you know, it's just like, I actually need to go back through and see how I have to revise these to make sure. The samples are all take in these blog posts are all just pulled in from the actual samples that I maintain regularly. So the samples are all right, but some of the words around them might be wrong. So that's that's probably the best documentation on YAML script is reading the advent calendar at the moment. Nice. A little behind on the documentation part. Um, okay, it's kind of the last slide. So what's the impact of all this going to be? I don't know. I didn't know what's YAML. We just did it. We knew it was a cool thing. And but we and we didn't even control it. It just, you know, it became what it was going to become type of thing. Um but as far as closure is concerned, if YAML is popular and it can help make closure more popular, because closure isn't popular enough. Sure. I remember like asking the AI, I'm like, because I, I thought for sure when I learned closure as my first Lisp that it was the most popular Lisp in the world. And then even the AI is like, no, no way. <laughs> the the, <laughs> the, the co-pilots are like, oh, no, that would be CL, but... Uh, but yeah, nice try. Um, so, yeah, if if this can be a boon to closure, that that would make me happy. I hope it's a boon to a lot of things. Um, 
these are some shout outs. Uh, ben, I talked about Mikhail Borkant, uh, Bork dude, helps me every day. My friend Tony wrote the Raku binding. This Rust guy dropped by, wrote an amazing binding. This guy, a friend of mine said, I can't help you, but ping this guy. And I pinged him and he's like, yeah, I can do it for you. So he wrote a pro binding in an afternoon. Cool. This guy's from the closure Slack. He's written three bindings. Uh, this is my friend. Some people are into this Nix OS, <laughs> which just, just seems like making your life harder for no reason. But yeah, just uh, download everything to temp <laughs> with the environment in there. <laughs> he uh he got the Nix packaging for it working. So good to him and him. Um Lee Reed is another you guys know him, right? Oh, uh, if you hang out on closure Slack, he's a he's just a helpful guy and he helps me a lot. Uh, Tina's on the call. Is she she dropped? She dropped. Okay. Um, well, maybe type in the thing that, uh, Tina Indy says you're awesome. Uh, yeah, I sure. <laughs> um, Troy is a friend of mine from Canada who followed the, the advent thing and almost every day and had lots of good comments and information and everybody on closure Slack has been amazing. So, um, this is the last slide. Yeah. So I'm going to put the links up. Uh, to the slides on that info page that I gave you, animalscript.org info. Um, this is a group effort. Like, I, I'll get your info afterwards, but I, I, are you on Slack at all? Yeah, I'm on the clicker on Slack. Okay. Right. So we're going to hook up and you're going to do the node thing or maybe, or like, anyway, get in pound script and sure. cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I try to just, I don't want to do it all. I want to find, make, I mean, Tony's like, when he first saw it, he's like, I think this is going to be a lot bigger than you think it is. And again, I'm like, uh, and then I kind of convinced him that I had a bigger vision than him. Which <laughs> <laughs> is like, yeah, this could be big. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Um, and there you go. Yes, why as we can. Why as we can. <laughs> nice. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Thank Thanks. you. It was Thanks. awesome. Awesome, Ningi. So, Ingi.